Hello my dear doctors, this is Dr. Azam here, your faculty of anatomy and biochemistry. And today I have come up with a new series. When I've taken a feedback from most of the students, they find it difficult to solve the questions in anatomy as well as biochemistry. And they are worried about from where to solve the questions, how to solve the questions. So I have come up with a solution now. So from now onwards, what we are going to do is, <clears throat> I hope you all know that one of the hot favorite book for all the FMGs is FMG Solution. So what we're going to do is we are going to solve the questions from FMG Solutions book along with me. So we are going to start with the series of solve the FMG Solution questions along with Dr. Azam from here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep these videos very short. Like in every video, we are going to solve like 10 questions so that it's not going to be like very lengthy and long. And at the same time, you're not going to disturb your schedule. So you're going to study whatever subject you want to study. And whenever you're free, just watch this simultaneously. Anatomy preparation also will become easier. Okay. So with this vision of helping you people, I'm going to start with this series. And anytime, if you have any kind of suggestions, please let me know. Okay. Now, now without wasting any further time here, let's get started with the very first questions in FMG solution. So the first question here is name the type of a joint present at the arrow marked region. Now, the moment you look at this diagram here, in this diagram, you're able to see ulna and the radius. And the arrow mark is pointed towards the middle radio ulna joint. So when you say between the ulna and the radius, there'll be like three joints here, superior, middle and the inferior radio ulna joints. Superior and inferior are actually the pivoid joint where the radius comes over ulna for pronation and supination over here. Okay, but whereas the middle, middle radio ulna joint is actually a immovable joint, a immovable joint. So when you have studied about the types of joint, I hope you all know that there are like three categories of joint. Number one, fibrous joint, the immobile one. Then number two, cartilaginous joint, partially immobile one. And number three will be the synovial joint, which are completely movable joint. <clears throat> Now in the first category over here, the fibrous joint, the fibrous joints are totally immovable joints. And these fibrous joints are in turn divided into three categories. So number one, you'll be having sutures, the, the joint between the cranial bones, that is sutures. Number two, the joint between the tooth and the socket, that is gomphosis. So you can remember like gum, gom, gomphosis. And then number three will be the syndesmosis. And syndesmosis will be the joint between any two bones with the help of a fibrous sheath or fibrous membrane. So that is interosseous membrane. In between the bones, there will be a membrane that is going to form the joint, that is syndesmosis. So now these three are the examples of fibrous joint. Let us repeat them again. Fibrous joint will be of three categories. Number one, sutures. Number two, gomphosis. And number three will be the syndesmosis. Is it okay? And now, my dear doctors, in this question over here, name the type of the joint present at the arrow marked region here. Yes, of course, you are able to see that is nothing but your syndesmosis. That's the right answer. Understanding? And uh, forget about the superior and inferior radial nerve joint. That is a totally different type of joint that is pivoid joint. And that is helping in pronation and supination. Is it okay? So I hope this is like very simple now. Now moving ahead with the next question, identify the arrow mark structure in the radiograph. Now in this given radiograph, the arrow mark is over here. So let me do one thing. Let me take this picture separately over here. Now in this radiograph, you're able to see the sagittal section. And we have discussed this in anatomy classes a lot of times, a lot of times. And I, I tell the students, if even you don't know neuroanatomy, never ever have a phobia of all these difficult, difficult diagrams. So what you're going to do here is start always from the known part. Now, what is the known part? Each and every medical student, even a first year MBBS student knows that this one here will be the spinal cord. That's your spinal cord. And if that's your spinal cord over there, of course, my dear doctors, above the spinal cord will be the medulla oblongata. And above the medulla oblongata, this one here will be the pons. Okay, and above the pons, definitely this one here, which should be the midbrain. Is it okay? So if this is your spinal cord over here, above the spinal cord, there'll be medulla. And then above the medulla, there'll be pons and then the midbrain. And the arrow mark was at this part here, that is your pons. So remember, <clears throat> the structure which is arrow marked in the diagram over there is actually the pons there, guys. Okay, so moving back, <clears throat> moving back to the question here. 
Now the arrow mark here is at pawns. So therefore, what is the answer for this question here, guys? That's your pawns. Perfectly done. It's so simple. Next, moving on to the next question now. Name the dural venous sinus arrow marked in the radiograph. So you can clearly see here there is a arrow mark here on this dural venous sinus and you need to identify that one. Okay. Now my dear doctors, if you people have attended my offline class or if you people have watched my videos on doc tutorials, I hope all of you know that we have studied this topic of dural venous sinuses in detail. Now in this, first of all, look at this diagram over here. Now in this diagram, we are actually having dural venous sinuses which are going to collect the blood from your brain. So now number one, you're able to see this one here. This is the superior sagittal sinus. And this one here below will be the inferior sagittal sinus. So sagittal exactly in the middle. And then one, one will be superior sagittal sinus. Another one is inferior sagittal sinus. And now these two are actually connected by the straight sinus over here straight sinus. So connecting the superior sagittal sinus and inferior sagittal sinus will be having the straight sinus. I think you people also have heard about the extensions of dura matter and modifications of dura matter and one of the modification will be between the two cerebral hemispheres will be having the fox cerebri, fox cerebri and in the upper margin of that one will be having superior sagittal sinus and below you'll be having the inferior sagittal sinus and those two will be connected by straight sinus. And now let's take a section of this one transverse section. So when you're taking a transverse section and we're looking from above, therefore you're able to see that this one is here is inferior sagittal sinus and this one here will be the superior sagittal sinus and both of them are connected by straight sinus. So therefore, my dear doctors, welcome back. Welcome back to this question over here. Yes. The inferior sagittal sinus and the superior sagittal sinus, both of them are connected by the straight sinus. So answer here should be the straight sinus. And one more important thing I'd like, like to tell you here is that, moving on to the same slide here. Yes, if this is the straight sinus here, it has been already asked in your exams that the straight sinus is the continuation of this vein over here. And that vein will be the vein of gallon. What is the vein? Vein of gallon, also known as the great cerebral vein. So one more MCQ that we are learning from here is great cerebral vein or vein of gallon continues as straight sinus. Okay. Now moving on to the next question. In unilateral hypoglossal nerve lesion, position of the tongue on protrusion is, oh ho. So this question is about the tongue topic and tongue topic is one of the hot favorite topic in FMG exam. Is it okay? And here they're actually asking about the clinical correlation of that one. If the nerve is injured, then what is going to happen? Now, first thing that every medical student should know is hypoglossal nerve is the one which is going to supply to all the muscles of tongue. All the muscles of tongue are supplied by the 12th cranial nerve that is hypoglossal nerve. And in that, my dear friends, remember one of the muscle which is helping in protrusion of tongue will be genioglossus. I hope you remember that, uh, you know, diagram genioglossus. So genioglossus will be helping in protrusion of tongue. And that muscle is actually paired. So we are actually having like two genioglossus. So whenever you ask any person to protrude the tongue, both the genioglossus will act together and the tongue will be protruding out. And now imagine like one of the hypoglossal nerve is injured. So just imagine that man lo, the left hypoglossal nerve is gone. So now when the person will try to protrude the tongue, then what is going to happen? left hypoglossal nerve is injured, the left <coughs> genioglossus muscle will be paralyzed, then what is going to happen? The right genioglossus muscle will become like more dominant and there is no one to oppose. Hey, no? So therefore, now when the patient is trying to protrude the tongue out, what is going to happen? The right one is more dominant, it's going to deviate on the other side. So therefore, what is going to happen? Whenever you are learning about the hypoglossal nerve injury, my dear friends, the tongue will be deviating towards the same side of the injury. I repeat again, that's the caption, that's the main important point there. The tongue deviates towards the same side of the injury. So when the patient is asked to protrude the tongue, the tongue deviates towards the paralyzed side. That is the side of lesion of hypoglossal nerve. Understand your point here? So if the tongue is deviating towards the left, it means left hypoglossal nerve is gone. If the tongue is deviating towards the right, it means right hypoglossal nerve is gone. So therefore, my dear doctors, <clears throat> now welcome back to this question again. In the unilateral hypoglossal nerve lesion, the position of tongue on protrusion is, is it midline? or deviates to ipsilateral side or contralateral side or no protrusion possible. Remember, it deviates towards the ipsilateral side. Perfectly done. 
Now moving on to the next question here. Identify the arrow mark structure in the dissected specimen. Wow, look at this specimen. Now in the specimen, <coughs> let me just enlarge this one here. Now in this specimen, you can very clearly see it is actually a transverse section through the thorax. You are able to see the lungs over here. We have taken a section through the thorax. Now second thing is that whenever we are taking sections, remember we are always always actually seeing from the inferior view towards the superior. Inferior view towards the superior. I hope you have learned in radiology as if we are standing near the feet of the person and from there we are viewing it. So a person is lying here and we are actually seeing from the inferior view. So when you're seeing from the inferior view over here, of course, this will be the right hand and that will be the left hand. So it is actually the right and the left. We are seeing from the inferior view. Now, if you have understood the orientation over here, now <clears throat> in this diagram, once you have understood the right and left, of course, here you'll be actually having the sternum. Okay, so because you're actually having the sternum over here, that is the anterior aspect. And here will be the thoracic vertebra. And this thoracic vertebra over here, that is a posterior aspect. And now, my dear doctors, right in front of the vertebra, right in front of the vertebra, you are able to appreciate this will be the esophagus over here. That is the esophagus over here. And now, if that is the esophagus here, now we, we all know, like, how do we draw the arch of aorta and the descending aorta? It will be always drawn towards left, you know, ascending aorta, arch of aorta and descending aorta. So because descending aorta always towards the left there, this is the left side here, definitely this has to be your descending aorta. That has to be the descending aorta. Now if this is the descending aorta over here, now the next thing is, you can clearly see these two structures over here, that's nothing but your trachea. Trachea is already bifurcated there. Trachea is already bifurcated. It means that if the bifurcation is already done, that means definitely we are at the level of T5. We are at le which level? We are at the level of T5. Done. Then, next one. Then, if this is the trachea over here, already bifurcated, then what about this structure here, guys? That is nothing but the pulmonary trunk, and the pulmonary trunk will be dividing into the two pulmonary arteries. And of course, I told you this is the left side here, this is the right side here. So, this is the left pulmonary artery, and this one here will be the right pulmonary artery. Perfectly done. And then, what is going to arch above the artery, pulmonary artery? Of course, your arch of iota. That is the reason why this has to be again the iota. So that is your ascending iota. Then it is going to arch and then come down here. That is your descending iota. And then what is the structure? This is nothing but superior vena cava. So whenever you see the structure of the heart from outside, you have ascending iota. And just right to that one, you'll be having the superior vena cava. So just on the right side, you'll be having superior vena cava here. Is it okay? So, once you have understood all this, in our, in our picture, in our question, this was, the, this was the structure which is arrow marked. And what is the name of that arrow marked structure? Yes, of course, it is your... Of course, that structure will be the descending iota. That is descending iota. So, esophagus, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, descending iota. So, the right option here will be the descending iota. Perfectly done. Okay. Now, after this, let's move ahead with the next question. A patient presents to emergency room with the pain and swelling in the right shoulder. The fracture of clavicle is suspected, the most common site of fracture. Whatever the story might be, they are simply asking you, what is the site of fracture of clavicle? Now, let me just show you in the picture over here. Now, this is our clavicle here. This is the collarbone here. And you all know very well, our clavicle or the collarbone will be always actually dividing into three parts. You know? one third and then one third and one third so this one here will be the medial one third and this one here will be the middle one third and this one here will be the lateral one third so there is medial one third middle one third and lateral one third now the most common site of fracture of the clavicle will be here this is the most common site of fracture of the clavicle will be here now how to describe there we are actually having two ways of describing this one. Be very careful with the terminology here, my dear friends. Listen to me carefully. We can say that, yes, the fracture of the clavicle most commonly occurs between middle one-third and lateral one-third. Be very careful with middle. Middle one-third and lateral one-third. But one more way of describing is, I'm not considering only this one-third, this entire thing. Now, this will be the medial two-third 
and then this is the lateral one third. So as I told you, there are like two ways of describing the same thing. You have to be at most careful in during your exam. Is it okay? So clavicle is most commonly fractured between middle one third and lateral one third. That is one way of describing. And another way of describing is medial complete two third and lateral one third. And that is what was exactly given in your exam over here. So it is getting fractured most commonly at the junction of medial two third at the junction of medial two third and lateral one third. So that is a place of most common fracture of the clavicle. I hope it is crystal clear. Next one, moving on to the next one. In the case of frozen shoulder, the marked muzzle, the marked muzzle is involved. Identify which movement has been compromised at the joint, at the shoulder joint. So first of all, look at this diagram, which is the marked muzzle that is above the spine of the scapula and that muzzle will be the supraspinatus muzzle. Easy name to remember, above the spine of the scapula that will be supraspinatus. Now if that muzzle is actually involved, then which movement will be affected? I hope you all remember my this video that I have posted on a YouTube channel of Dr. Tutorials. Yes abduction of arm a person can do the abduction of arm starting from 0 degrees from 0 to 15 degrees will be done by supraspinatus muscle and from 15 to 90 degrees will be done by deltoid muscle and above 90 degrees it will be done by trapezius along with serratus anterior muscle one of the extremely important concept for your fmg exam is it okay i repeat again 0 to 15 degrees is done by supraspinatus muscle Okay, 15 to 90 degrees will be done by deltoid muscle and above 90 degrees that is overhead abduction will be done by trapezius and serratus anterior. Now welcome back to our question right now. <clears throat> in this question, in the frozen shoulder if this muscle is involved, then what is the action that is actually affecting here? That is nothing but abduction. Abduction will be done by supraspinatus muscle from 0 to 15 degrees. Then the next thing here, after this question, let us move on to the next question now, my dear friends. Identify the aroma tendon in this diagram. Now, this is another very, very hot favorite question of FMG examiner. This is about the anatomical snuff box. They have asked this question n number of times in the FMG exam. Okay, that to image based question. Okay, so now in this diagram, let me just take another diagram here. <clears throat> This is the anatomical snuff box. I, I hope if you people have attended my offline classes, we have done this practically. So please extend your thumb. So once you extend the thumb, here you are able to see the depression and this is known as the anatomical snuff box. If you just touch on either side, you'll be able to see the two tendons over there, the boundaries, the lateral boundary and the medial boundaries. You'll be able to find on both the sides. Okay. Now, now my dear friends, remember on the lateral side and on the medial side, you'll be able to find these tendons. Now on the lateral side, you'll be actually having two tendons and those two tendons will be extensor pollicis brevis. Another one will be the abductor pollicis longus. Extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. And on the medial side, medial side of the anatomical snuff box, you'll be able to find only one tendon and that one tendon here will be the extensor pollicis longus extensor pollicis longus. I repeat again, on the lateral side two tendons and on the medial side only one tendon, okay? Now, let us go back to our picture here. Now, in this picture, you are able to see this tendon here will be actually the one which is towards the medial side and that one will be extensor pollicis longus tendon. That is extensor pollicis longus tendon, guys, okay? Now, moving ahead with the next one, the marked line corresponds to which vertebral level? This marked line is corresponding to which vertebral level? Now in the abdomen, you can very clearly see this line is just above the umbilicus over here. So now let me show you this picture here with all the planes here. Now the one which is given in the question there is subcostal plane. And subcostal plane will be present at the level of L3. Okay, and that is just above the umbilicus and you can very clearly see in our diagram here, the umbilicus will be between L3 and L4. Umbilicus, the what is the position of umbilicus between L3 and L4. And one thing I want to clarify here, every student after that exam was answering it is like T10, T10, T10. Uh, remember, T10 is actually the dermatome, dermatome level of umbilicus. Umbilicus, the skin over there will be supplied by 
T10. So in the question, it is not about umbilicus or dermatome level. They are asking at which vertebral level. So remember, umbilicus is between L3 and L4. And the plane just above that one, subcostal plane will be at the level of L3. And just to finish this concept here, one more plane here, that is your transpyloric plane or Addison's plane. Transpyloric plane will be at the level of L1. Why? Because here itself, what is going to happen? You have your stomach here and in the stomach, the fundus body and finally, what will have here, that is a pylorus of the stomach. And that plane is going to pass through the pylorus part of the stomach, transpyloric plane. And the transpyloric plane will be at the level of L1. Subcostal plane at the level of L3. And one more last one that you have to remember is transtubercular plane. Even this one was asked in the exam. Now, in this, you are able to see the iliac crest. And iliac crest will be having that iliac tubercle and Connecting the two tubercles, there is transtubercular plane and that is at the level of L5. So transpyloric plane at the level of L1, subcostal plane at the level of L3 and transtubercular plane at the level of L5. Remember all the three of them. And coming back to our question here, in our question they have asked about the subcostal, subcostal definitely at the level of L3 here. So Now moving ahead with the next one. Which arterial pulse is being taken here? Oh, ho. the moment you look at that image, hello, my dear friends, most of the time for measuring the pulse, you'll be using the radial artery, you know, radial pulse over here. But apart from the radial pulse, we also have many other sites for measuring the peripheral pulse. And one of the site here will be the tarsal tunnel. What is the site here, guys? That is nothing but your tarsal tunnel. Okay. And we have studied this a lot of times in our classes. Now, the moment you look at this diagram here, this is tibia on the medial side. And this one is a fibula on the lateral side. Is it okay? And this one here will be your heel bone, that is calcaneus. Perfect. Now, between the tibia, that is medial malleolus of the tibia and the calcaneus, you are able to see a sheath here. And that fibrous sheath will be flexor retinaculum. Flexor retinaculum. And now there is a tunnel formed here and this tunnel will be tarsal tunnel and you are able to see like so many structures passing from there. Now in that tarsal tunnel all the structures which are passing from there I hope you remember from our regular classes and even the videos on doctorial that the mnemonic for remembering the structures will be Tom, Dick and Harry. Okay and in that Tom, Dick and Harry remember A, A stands for this artery here. What is the name of this artery? This one here will be the posterior tibial artery posterior tibial artery and if you just keep your fingers over here you'll be able to measure the pulse and that is nothing but exactly shown in this picture over here so which arterial pulse is being taken here of course it is the posterior tibial artery pulse which is taken here is it okay so my dear friends in this video, we are actually done with the discussion of all the 10 questions from the FMG Solutions book. So that is how I'm trying to actually help you out, help all my foreign medical graduates with a little bit effort that I can do from my end to solve your problem of solving the questions. Okay, now. So start solving the questions of anatomy along with me from FMG Solutions and every video I'll be come up with, coming up with 10 questions which are exactly in sequence with that book in sync with that book okay so all those questions you can keep on solving along with me and i'll be like always always waiting for your valuable suggestions any constructive suggestions you can always help me out guys and please don't forget to subscribe to all my social media channels over here is it okay everywhere available with the name of dr azim lectures okay hope this is helpful waiting for your valuable suggestions thank you take care all the best